Ariana Star, but you can call me Ari for short. Welcome to my YouTube channel. Feel free to subscribe and leave a like. Enjoy the show! Attention Miko Lights! The following video contains descriptions and imagery that some viewers may find disturbing or offensive. Your discretion is strongly advised. Chubby Bunny Carson, a young, tall, slender, black-haired person with gorgeous purple eyes and a smile that can melt any heart. Carson can be a very protective, passionate, and caring person. They have long, slender legs and a tight stomach. A very beautiful person, nonetheless. They have a small, loving, yet rash, 12-year-old Neko Lynx pet named Ariana. Ari has dull red eyes, though not as alluring as Carson's, they still have a sense of innocent charm embedded in their core. Long, well-kept red hair with various lengths of bangs extending from her informal sun hat. Soft, gray, nourished fur extends from her large lynx ears and long, slender, lustrous cat tail. Little Ari has a very sweet personality. She's always looking to make everyone happy. Though she can be a little hyperactive at times, it's always with a good, trusting heart. Nobody can do wrong in her eyes. The year is 2010. The warm August breeze is especially affable and comforting. The shimmering sun rays reflect the perfection of a Sunday outing. But this is no ordinary Sunday outing. The sense of eagerness and excitement that engulfs the car is ecstatic. Carson pulls the car into a lone parking spot. They both get ready for a nice day out at the city carnival. It's not often the carnival comes to town. You see, Carson and Ari live in a small, remote town of 20,000 people, so it's always a treat when anything comes to town. The very moment the car is parked, the back door swings open. Ari is too excited to wait for anything. The very moment her feet hit the ground, she is taken in by the smell of fresh carnival donuts and popcorn. Those red eyes of hers sparkled, and her jaw dropped, taking in the grand spectacle of raised tents and large crowds. Wow, she says in amazement by the sheer whimsy of it all. Carson gives Ari their signature heartwarming smile while taking her hand. You make sure to stay close to me, okay? We don't need you getting lost in a place like this. Carson's voice is kind, yet stern. It's almost motherly. Little Ariana wastes no time at all before she starts pulling her owner through the dense crowds of people towards the smell of popcorn. This way, this way, I, I want that! She stops abruptly, pointing to a large tent serving hefty pails of various popcorn flavors. Carson laughs softly while ruffling Ariana's hair. Of course, sweetie, you've been a very good girl. You sit here and wait for me. No wandering off or talking to strangers. Ari hesitates at first. Oh, uh, yep. Carson kneels down and looks into her wandering eyes. If you get lost, find one of the workers. Do you understand, baby girl? You can trust them. Carson now has Ari's full attention. She sits on the bench and says with an adorable smile, Yes, Mama, I understand. Carson ruffles her hair once more before lining up for the popcorn. Richard, a heavy-set man wearing a stained white muscle shirt and a long orange apron, cleans the counter to the concession stand. Trash is scattered all over the place from his patrons. He scratches his coarse stubble as his frustration grows. His eyes spot a woman leaving an empty cup and an empty wrapper of candy on the once spotless counter. The woman has that entitled look about her, where she judges everyone she looks at. He finds himself grumbling, reaching for it, when a small boy, maybe eight years old, picking up the garbage his mother had left behind. Sorry, the kid whispers before putting the cup into the trash bin. Thank you, champ, Richard says, while giving off a sigh of relief. He then smiles to the boy and pulls a bag of marshmallows from the display. He extends his arm, offering the bag to the child. The boy reaches for the marshmallows, stricken with instant joy before violently getting pulled away from him by his mother. How many times have I told you not to speak to strangers? He could be a gross child predator, she yells to the boy only inches from his ear. He's only cleaning up your mess, lady. Calm down, 
Richard defends the boy. The woman's spiteful gaze turns on Richard, a predator finding its prey, hate emanating from her very essence. You will not speak to me like that. I'm a mother. You're working this gross minimum wage job because you're probably not good at anything. Her rampage builds. Richard is unable to get a single word in. The woman talks loud, fast, and fierce. She has definitely done this before. You're an overweight, middle-aged man working at a fucking carnival. You get your kicks from preying on children, huh? Answer me. Don't just stand there looking stupid. The loud jabs of insults has encouraged a crowd of onlookers. Richard's face is red. His anger rises. Who does she think she is? He tosses his towel down, ready to let her have it. Years of being walked on has come to this very moment. His fists are clenched. He leans forward, heading towards the woman. Richard's shoulder gets a firm jolt back. A quick glance back reveals his boss. The cavalry has arrived. What seems to be the problem? His tone is firm yet understanding. Your employee was forcing my boy into child labor. He made him clean the food stand and was going to pay him with stolen product. She voices with her chest puffed, motioning to the bag of marshmallows. That's not what happened at all, Richard cries out, coming to his own defense. Did the boy clean for you? His boss asks calmly. Well, yes, Richard mumbles hesitantly. Were these paid for? The marshmallows are now the prime evidence in this investigation. No, I was going to pay for them on break. Richard is crumbling. Keep the candy as a parting gift. The boss says quietly as he pulls Richard's apron off. Richard's vision blurs with tears. Defeated, he brings himself to grabbing his coat, stepping out of the concession stand. The crowd reaches full scale, eyes of disgust following him. He finds himself sitting on one of the concession parks. He glares around at his surroundings. Fucking entitled asshole families. He grumbles loudly while rummaging through his pockets for his cigarettes. They're not there. Just those damn marshmallows. They were probably left in the apron. Richard's heart pounds with anger and frustration. His gaze turns onto little Airy, sitting on a neighboring bench, kicking her feet, humming to herself. She doesn't have a care in the world. Pure innocence emanates off of the small child. Her hummed song feels out of place to Richard's anger. Ariana glances over at Richard and gives him a friendly wave. Richard takes a quick survey of the area for any onlookers before returning the wave, hesitant and awkward. Richard stuffs the marshmallows into his pocket and switches seats to get closer. You're not supposed to be upset at a carnival, mister. It's a happy place. She spots the bag of marshmallows protruding from his pocket. Mister, where's your mother, little one? His voice has shifted to a soft and soothing tone. Her head tilts in a slight bout of confusion. I don't have a mommy. She pauses in an awkward silence. Her primary focus is still on the sweets. But I do have an owner. She's really nice. You should meet her. Ari softly giggles. Her cheerful demeanor comes right back. You're interested in these? Richard grasps the bag with his fingers, pulling it out. The very sight of it brings disgust to his soul. Uh-huh. Ari gets on her feet, standing on the bench seat in order to get a good look at the bag. The bag is ruffled up a bit from being in his pocket. The plump white treats are easily visible through the plastic. They are more appealing than gold to the small child. You can have some if you'd like. He rips the bag open. The aroma of sugar takes hold of Ari's senses. I, I'm not allowed taking things from strangers, she says under her breath. I'm Richard. I work here at the carnival now. I'm not a stranger. He continues to hold the bag steady for her as he leans in to catch a whiff of her hair. You live at a carnival? I'm Ari. Mommy says I can trust workers. She reaches for the bag, being unable to quell the temptation. <laughs> now you're calling her mommy. You think mommy will let you have one? Richard keeps the bag at a slight distance of her reach while he waits for an answer. Uh, yeah, of course. Carson would let me have one. They're right over... Ari screens the lineup for Carson. She can't find them anywhere. Worry and panic begins to set in. Carson? Where are you? She climbs up on top of the bench, looking all around. Her sun hat almost flies off from the panicked jerking. Let's go find her together, little one. You can also have some of the marshmallows while we look. Richard picks her up off the bench. Her soft, delicate skin is so smooth to the touch. Richard guides the small girl away from her table with the promise of helping her out. Ari, you like sweets? 
Aries' interest is piqued by the very mention of sugar. Oh, of course, Rich. Richard places his large thumb over her soft, delicate lips. Please, darling, call me Papa. His thumb slowly releases her lips. Open wide, darling. Little Aries' worries melt away as the bag of jumbo marshmallows come into view. Her tail sways, showing her innocent excitement. Like this, Papa? She asks as she opens her mouth as wide as she can. His calm demeanor subsides, while a more sinister grin takes its place. Without hesitation, he pushes the large sugary treat into her mouth, leaving his finger in there for a few seconds. This causes Aries' concern to grow, but they are quickly pruned by the sweet taste of marshmallow. Richard breaks the silence with a seemingly innocent question. Want to play a game? Aries begs the man in a muffled tone. It, it won't fit, Papa. Richard stuffs marshmallow after marshmallow into her small mouth. Her face is red. A bead of drool runs down her chin, tears forming in her tear ducts. You can fit a lot more, princess, he says as he drags his dirty knuckles across her soft, bloated cheek. The small girl slowly runs out of breath. She takes a large swallow. The marshmallows get lodged halfway down her throat. Panicked, she drops the marshmallow bag, scattering them all over the floor. Startled by her sudden movement, Rich backs up. C -c -c cut that out! The now frightened man stutters while he gives her a firm and abrupt shake, causing Aries' breath to gargle out a sound. <coughs> she continues to grab at her throat, now unable to produce any sounds. Her eyes fixate on Richard. <coughs> she watches a bead of sweat roll down his brow. He looks over his shoulder with a panicked and worried face. He then backs up into the crowd of passing people, disappearing among them as a handful of women rush to Airy. Oh my god, someone get help! One woman screams out to the others. She then reaches into Airy's mouth, pulling out the globs of sugar and saliva. Airy's chest tightens, making her movement slower. The carnival lights begin to dim and blur. Little Ariana drops to the ground. The asphyxiation is too much to bear. Watching the women's worried faces, her eyelids grow heavy. Carson anxiously pushes their way through the astonished crowd. They lift Aries' chin up, trying to get her eyes to focus on them. Aries' focus drifts towards the crowd. Her eyes are fixated on a man in the crowd. She notices nothing but his red eyes. Everything fades to black. Several confused people bring out their flip phones to record the ordeal. Carson keeps close to Aries tears streaming down their face, attempting to resuscitate her. Carson yells at the crowd of onlookers to either disperse or give some productive help. Carson puts their focus back into Airy, placing their ear to her mouth, listening for a breath. Carson pleads with Airy to wake up as the chest compressions begin. Salty tears continue to roll down their cheek, blurring Carson's vision. The chest compressions continue on Airy's chest. Her small body jolts with each press, the onlookers begin to retreat while several take photos. After several minutes, paramedics make their way to the scene. They lift little Airy onto a stretcher, taking her into the back of an ambulance. Carson follows, sobbing. The ambulance's tires screech as it leaves the carnival in a hurry. The roar of the engine is only interrupted by the piercing sirens. They loudly whirl as the ambulance speeds off down the road. The cars littering the roadways abruptly dive to the sides of the road, making strides to avoid the speeding emergency vehicle. Dashing through the streets, running red lights, exceeding traffic speeds, it arrives to the emergency entrance at the local hospital. The first responders rush Airy into the building, passing her off to the doctors. Carson gives chase but is ultimately held back by the operating room doors. The gentleman with crimson red eyes from before stands against the wall. He's dressed in a white dress shirt, polished dress shoes and a sleek black vest. An obsidian black feather quill rests on his ear. She's not going to make it, love. Alas, not without my help. His voice is smooth and charming, almost sickly smooth, as if he had practiced that this was his trade. Don't you dare say things like that about Ari. I'm not your love. Carson wipes their eyes, squaring up with the man in a challenging manner. He sneers at Carson's remark. Not very cultured, are we? My name's Mendax. I'm sure it's an honor for you to meet me. He gestures with a bow. Carson watches, brow furled, not amused. I'm not telling you my name. I jest, of course. Pleasantries aside, 
I'm here for business. As I stated before, Eri isn't going to return without my help. If there's one thing that can be said about me, it's that I love the opportunity to help people. Mendax paces indirectly closer to Carson. You're wrong. Those doors are going to open up in ten minutes. Ari's going to pop through those doors, rattled but healthy. We're going to go home and she's going to be fine. The tears begin to form in Carson's eyes yet again. Mendax rolls up his sleeve to check his watch. He looks over to Carson with a stern look. Three minutes. The door will open and the doctor will have a grim look on his face. It will be a staged look. He won't have remorse. He will immediately change the topic to treatment and, of course, expenses. It will cost you a pretty penny and nothing will change. She will still die. You will be broke and sad. You're wrong, Carson repeats, trying to convince himself more than anyone else. And if I'm right, wouldn't you do anything for the child? It appears to me that you have three choices. You can play the medical care system's game. Come out with spending every penny you own. Debt for two extra weeks with a broken, weak girl stuck in a bed. Second option would be to do nothing. Let the girl perish. Pay for the ambulance ride, the doctors, treatment, then a humane burial. That'll take most of your savings, but you will still walk out of here free of figurative chains. He adjusts his vest, brushing off some dust. Carson, feeling helpless and broken. Third option? Their voice is low and weak. Ah, yes. The third option would most likely be the most desirable for all parties involved. The child will live for many more years. Well, depending on her life choices, of course. A few nasty dreams here and there. A discerning dislike for marshmallows. Carnivals and degenerates named Richard. You will be overjoyed knowing that you got her the best treatment possible without breaking the bank. Carson watches him for a brief moment. And... What do you get from this deal? The operating doors swing open. A doctor and a surgeon steps out. Both have grim looks on their faces. The young woman doctor takes Carson aside. I have some good and bad news. The good news being she survived the operation. The bad news is that her brain was without oxygen for so long. We have some treatments, but they aren't cheap. Carson glances over at Mendax, then back to the doctor. Can I have some time to think this over? They ask, still with the sound of defeat in their voice. The doctor nods in agreement. Sure, just don't take too long. She lifts the clipboard and begins to write, notioning to the surgeon to meet them in the other room. They both leave, walking right through Mendax as if he wasn't even there. Mendax moves in and puts his arm around Carson. So, do we have a deal? What's the cost of the deal? What do you get for doing this? It's definitely not from the goodness of your heart. Carson asks, skeptically pushing Mendax back a bit. Thick, black smoke pours from his sleeve. The sound of tormented souls shrieking emanates from the smoke. A long piece of parchment paper unravels from his hand. The smell of brimstone stains the air. That's not a good sign, Carson indicates while taking an additional step back, creating more distance between them. Just one small payment. I want the child when her time comes. Mendax says with a soft sneer. Carson shakes their head profusely. No, I'm not trading her soul away to a demon. Mendax scowls at Carson, face struck with disgust. A demon, you say? Are you accusing me of being a red-skinned goat man from the fiery depths of the abyss? Frankly, I find you mortals' depictions of me quite offensive. You're not getting her soul. Carson stomps the ground, not budging. You're going to have to give me something worth a life. The only way I can make it work. His eyes become stone cold with an unearthly glare. My life? For hers? Carson shrinks down. They've already decided. Are you humans not wired for self-preservation? The foolish act of sacrificing oneself is a blind and misguided attempt for grandeur. The thought that your life has more meaning for an act of heroic humility is nonsensical. He begins to pace, a predator squaring up his prey. I've decided. You can take my soul. Eri lives a long, healthy life. You will not target her soul. Carson stands there, giving himself up. No more fight. 
The sacrificial lamb sits at the gates to the slaughterhouse. He pulls the black quill from above his ear. Then, I digress. I will admit that this is not my first choice, but I can work with it regardless. His voice is stern, almost snake-like. Carson attempts to write. Nothing shows up. Nothing but scratches on the page from the pointed end of the quill. There's no ink. An expression of confusion grows. You must use your blood. The only contract worth signing can only be signed with your blood. If you thought I was a lying and scheming person, then you never met a human. They'll turn tail in seconds. Blood pacts. It's the only way to get the mortals to keep their word. Carson hesitantly pricks their soft finger with the tip of the quill. Upon touching the blood, the quill heats up, soaking up the small beaded spillage. Bright amber and orange embers flake off the feather, rising up into the air. There's a distinctive burning smell poisoning Carson's senses. The feather whirls out a swift and neatly rounded cursive signature, which immediately burns into the page. Can I at least say goodbye before you take me? Carson looks up with pleading eyes as the parchment contract engulfs itself in flames and turns to ash, spilling onto the polished hospital floor. No, you've signed the contract already. It's time to go. He gestures to the exit. No, she needs to know why I'm leaving. Shoving Mendax aside and running towards the operating room Ari is in. Mama? A soft voice can be heard on the other side of the door. I'm coming, baby! Carson rips the door open, frantically pushing themselves into the room. Running a few steps, the room is cold, empty, dark, a black abyss with no sounds, no light, only loneliness. Ari? Baby? Carson's voice echoes from the void. They look back behind them to see the door, gone. The little Ariana sits up, hearing her name. Mama? She looks around the hospital room, frightened. Nothing but the sound of beeping hospital machines reply. Are you awake, sweetie? A nurse steps in gingerly. You've been asleep for a long time. Your uncle is here to take you home, she says with a calming voice, helping her out of the hospital bed. Uh, uncle? Ari gives the nurse a confused glance. The nurse guides Ari to the exit, holding her hand. They arrive at the reception desk where Ari spots Richard standing there. Like a nightmare, he stares right back. Papa? Richard? Ari is in shock. She's unable to express her feelings. The nurse guides Ari to Richard. Your niece is a little miracle. We almost thought she wasn't going to make it. She had a complete turnaround. W where's Mama? Ari asks, getting scared. Richard lifts her up. Mama is waiting for you. We got a little drive to get there, honey. He softly caresses Ari's leg. He missed the feeling of her soft skin. You two drive safely. Take care of yourself, Ari. The nurse waves to them as Richard leads Ari out the front door.